Today is day two of my four day quantum mechanics preparation session study extravaganza for my quantum mechanics midterm. I thought I'd take some time to go over sort of how I'm approaching studying for this class and um, yeah, see how that goes. Now this is actually my second semester of quantum mechanics and right now what we're going over, or rather right now what we're about to get tested on is um, angular momentum and perturbation theory. Angular momentum is kind of a broad thing because we're talking about total angular momentum, adding angular momentum, uh, spin angular momentum, and calculating things using the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Uh, so that part's actually pretty involved. And then we're also doing just first order perturbation theory. And perturbation theory is kind of like when you have a problem that you don't know how to solve, but you remember a problem that's easier that you do know how to solve, so you solve that one instead, and then add some stuff to it to make it more similar to the problem that you don't know how to solve. And that's the main idea behind perturbation theory. Um, so that's the section that I'm actually least worried about. The one that I'm spending a lot of time on today is, uh, is angular momentum. And then as you can see here, all of this writing on here is pretty much the studying that I have to get done by Thursday. The VO stuff is just my professor's lecture notes, and then this stuff is just Griffith's, Griffith's quantum. Cool. So a lot of people are curious as to how you study for like the upper level physics classes. And really, I mean, five years, four years of undergrad has taught me that there's no substitute for just going in the book and reading it. So a huge part of how I'm studying for this is I'm reading both chapter four and chapter six of Griffiths, which has to do with, again, just angular momentum, angular, angular momentum, and then perturbation theory. Um, I'm reading Griffiths first because my professor's lecture notes are a bit more involved than Griffiths is. Griffiths is presented in a, in a simpler way, I would say. It's not even, it's not a better way necessarily. He just gives you sort of easier problems. Um, so going over Griffiths, uh, then tackling my professor's lecture notes, then reworking the homework problems, and then I should be good to go. I feel pretty good right now, but I, having said that, I wouldn't want to take it right now. But yeah, really what I've been doing since Quantum 1 has just been essentially taking, like retaking my notes from the book in my own words, cutting out all the crap, like the, just the words that are in the book and just reworking some of the harder examples. The section that we're on now is pretty much coming up right here. So this is an example of uh, perturbation theory. Uh, first order is pretty, pretty straightforward actually, it's not too bad, uh, especially when you're working with non-degenerate per perturbation theory, which says that you don't have uh, repeating eigenvalues, so um, the, here we just have some basic definitions where we're getting into angular momentum. A big part of this angular momentum section has to do with what operators don't commute with each other. And what I mean by that is, if you were to take measurements on these two quantities at the same time, would you be able to do it? Certain things you can do that, and certain things you can't. One thing that you can't do is you can't measure both angular momentum in the x direction and in the y direction at the same time, because they don't commute with each other. So you're faced with this problem of finding quantities that do, and extracting a function, a wave function, out of that. Now the whole thing with operators and wave functions to begin with is uh, an operator is just a linear transformation, right? You operate on some function and what you get back is that function scaled to some degree, assuming that it's the eigenfunction of the operator, or an eigenfunction rather. Um, so a good example is if you were to take the Hamiltonian operator, which is just one part of the Schrodinger equation, and you act on the eigenfunction, which is the wave function, what you get back is the wave function scaled by a little bit. And that value that it's scaled corresponds to the energy of the particle, and that energy is also the eigenvalue. Now you can kill two birds with one stone sometimes, like you can have an eigenfunction that satisfies multiple, that is uh, an eigenfunction that satisfies multiple operators. Um, for example, the spherical harmonic wave function, or part of the wave function, is typically an eigenfunction of the square angular momentum, and the z component of the angular momentum. A part of the reason I'm saying all this is to further uh, enforce that I understand it in my own head. So sorry if this doesn't really mean anything to you, but it's, it's helpful for me to talk about. I don't see myself getting past angular momentum tonight, which means that tomorrow is probably gonna be the day that I spend on perturbation theory. 
But I'm okay with that because I don't think that'll take too long anyways. Because keep in mind, we're doing first order, non-degenerate, time-independent perturbation theory. It really doesn't get much more simple than that. Uh, which just goes to show that my professor is probably going to focus on the angular momentum section. If any interesting developments pop up with me studying tonight, I'll probably record something of that. But if not, I'll probably just give a little update tomorrow. And I'm probably going to have this video continue into tomorrow, which for you will be today. So I'll see you guys today. Okay, day three of studying, and I think I'm starting to finally understand the coupling of orbital angular momentum and spin angular momentum. So, orbital angular momentum, you look for an eigenstate. Well, you look for an eigenstate for anything, such that when you act on it with an operator, you get back that state scaled to whatever degree. Um, now, the Hilbert space that this eigenstate forms a basis in is independent of the one that spin forms a basis in, which means that orbital angular momentum commutes with spin angular momentum. Again, the significance of operators commuting with each other means that you can make measurements on those eigenvalues simultaneously. So what this tells you is that you can make a measurement on the angular momentum, orbital angular momentum of a system, in some direction at the same time as you can the spin angular momentum in the same direction. Uh, now, since they commute, it's fair game to look for another eigenstate that satisfies both of those operators. But because those operate or because those eigenstates separately are in different Hilbert spaces, the state that satisfies both is going to be a direct product of states. So I think it's coming together now. Cool, so I have been going at it for studying for about six or so hours now. I'm feeling a lot more confident about this exam. There's still a little bit more that I need to go over because um, concepts like touch gordon coefficients are still a little bit difficult for me to calculate. Just because you have to understand, given what certain eigenvalues are, what limits that places on other ones, and that's just something I'm not fluent in yet. But as soon as that's taken care of, I should be more or less ready for this, for this exam. Probably gonna call it here though, that way I can just see whatever, I don't even know how much I've recorded, probably not very much, but the exam's tomorrow. Feeling pretty good, gonna wake up tomorrow morning and study a bit more, and then I have another exam in my programming class right after that. So, let's do it. <laughs>